exporting. And actually, our exports are down, <laughs> which is shocking. Mm -hmm. um, they're about down about 5% uh, under these free trade agreements. So uh, they, have not <laughs> they have not created jobs. They've actually cost jobs for the American public. Um, and yet, they're trying to expand this model of agreement throughout the Pacific Rim now. Okay. Hello, and welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, the Populist Dialogues. I'm your host, David Delk. In 1992, President George H.W. Bush signed the North American Free Trade Agreement between the United States, Mexico, and Canada. It didn't become effective until January 94 when President Clinton signed it into law. Both presidents had promoted the agreement. In President Clinton's words, NAFTA means jobs, American jobs, and good-paying American jobs. If I didn't believe that, I wouldn't support this agreement. Yet critics feared and have since pointed to job losses for Americans, harm to American farmers, and rising trade deficits between the United States and both Canada and Mexico. The United States has enjoyed a comfortable trade surplus with Mexico prior to the implementation of NAFTA. Critics also note the undemocratic way in which the agreement was put in effect, as well as the undemocratic effects of the agreement itself. The agreement gave power to corporations to sue national host governments to overturn laws and regulations which were said to harm corporate bottom lines. Now President Obama, who included calls for renegotiation of NAFTA and other free trade agreements in his first presidential campaign, is negotiating a new agreement based on the NAFTA model called the Trans-Pacific Partnership. That agreement has been dubbed NAFTA on steroids. Today, we welcome back Arthur Stamolas, Executive Director of the Citizens Trade Campaign. We're going to talk about free trade and the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Formerly, Arthur was the Executive Director of Oregon Free Trade Campaign. So, welcome to the show, Arthur. Thanks for having me. Yeah, good to have you back. Yeah, so, um, uh, would you just talk about NAFTA a little bit? Uh, give us a little details, so something about the process in which it became an agreement with the United S for the United States? Sure. So NAFTA uh, is a free trade agreement between the U.S., Mexico, and Canada. Um, as you said, as it was first debated in the early 90s, um, you know, th they held out the promise of jobs. It was going to create new export markets uh, for U.S. manufacturers. That was going to create jobs in the United States. It was also supposedly going to lift living standards in countries, you know, Mexico in particular. Um, Janet Reno had a famous quote that, you know, it was going to lift living standards so much that uh, undocumented migration would decrease by two thirds by the year 2000. <laughs> well, that didn't um, work out. <laughs> no, it, it didn't. And, well, you know, what we saw instead was that um, Ross Perot was right. It did create a, this giant sucking sound right. of jobs. Ross you know, Perot was. Ross Perot was a uh, third party candidate for president, a uh, you know, very rich, wealthy individual uh -huh. who was able to uh, force himself in, into the presidential debate. Um, and, you know, on, on NAFTA, he was right. Um, that it did move a lot of jobs from the United States to just across the border, northern Mexico, where people were paid uh, far, far less money for doing the same work. Um, at the same time, it also led to a flood of subsidized agricultural products from the United States being dumped into Mexican markets and, fl and forcing about two million uh, Mexican farmers off their land into, you know, into money, into the migration mm -hmm. flow. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it worked really well for those at the top. Uh, you know, the companies that were now getting access to much cheaper labor, um, but it didn't work it well for working people in the U.S. or Mexico. Right. Okay, yeah. And, uh, talk a little bit about the fast track uh, authority mm -hmm. that, uh, that, that this was negotiated under. Yeah, so fast track is actually a Nixon era uh, policy making tool where, where the Constitution gives Congress uh, the authority to set the terms of trade policy and, and trade agreements. Um, Nixon wanted to just have the power to just write trade treaties himself and have no <laughs> <laughs> congressional say whatsoever. <laughs> they compromised and said, all right, well, we'll, get, we'll grant the administration the right to, um, to negotiate the treaties, but we still get a, a vote on whether or not to accept them. But Fast Track eliminates ordinary uh, amendment, debate procedures, committee review procedures, and it just allows Congress a thumbs up or a thumbs down vote. So you can have, you know, a, a pact that's literally thousands of pages long, and Congress is unable to change a single word of it, uh, make a single tweak. It's just take it or leave it. And for the most part, uh, they've taken it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, you know, it's how all our biggest, nastiest trade agreements 
NAFTA, um, you know, permanent normal trade relations for China, CAFTA have all passed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. So, so, you know, whenever I talk about a fast track authority, I talk about the fact that uh, that Congress is left out of the negotiations itself in the first place. So that's, right. that's an undemocratic uh, mm -hmm. aspect of it. And then, uh, unlike any other agreement or any other legislation that Congress would debate, uh, Congress doesn't debate it. That's right. They're for they're forced to take a vote within a certain number of days. Um, again, they they often will have some sort of committee hearings, but you know, if they can't make any changes, <laughs> it's, it's for show. Um, and you know, it's, it's, a, it's a take it or leave it, thumbs up or thumbs down vote. And all the sort of, you know, democratic policy making procedures that go into any other legislation, even any other, you know, treaty oftentimes um, are, are eliminated just in the realm of trade policy. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, so N NAFTA, CAFTA, all the three, uh, agreements that we recently uh, mm -hmm. signed, the agreement with uh, Jordan, uh, the one with Australia, all of them were negotiated using fast yeah, track Yeah, the vast, authority. vast majority of them. I think there was maybe one that passed without it. I, you know, which is not to say you can't have trade policy without fast track. We've had, uh, you know, trade policy for hundreds of years <laughs> without, yeah. without it. And there have certainly been some smaller, less controversial agreements that just pertain to trade, um, you know, since Nixon, but uh, these big, bad, far-reaching agreements that take a lot of uh, decision-making out of the hands of the U.S. government and, and put it into these international tribunals um, have all passed under fast track. Okay. All right, so let's talk about that, because that, yeah. that is clearly another really undemocratic aspect mm -hmm. of these trade agreements. Let's talk about the, the trade tribunals and, and uh, what they are and how they come yeah. into play. So under the, under the World Trade Organization, um, there are provisions where foreign governments can challenge each other's policies, their regulations, their permitting decisions, even their court decisions as barriers to trade. So, you know, uh, our corporation didn't get a permit that they wanted. You passed a new environmental law that's affecting their ability to trade or invest across borders. That's a barrier to trade. We're going to challenge that. So under the World Trade Organization, um, parts of you know the U.S. Clean Air Act, the Marine Mammal Protection Act, the Endangered Species Act have been rolled back. Uh, internet gambling laws have come under attack. Uh, the U.S. has lost over 90 percent of of more than 65 cases that have been brought against us under the WTO. Where free trade agreements go even further is that they allow individual corporations to file those sorts of challenges, um, so that you know a government has lots of considerations about whether or not it's going to challenge U.S. law or, or not, you know, they're going to try to solve it diplomatically. A corporation is empowered under these FTAs, these free trade agreements, to implement those challenges themselves. And so these challenges are heard not in the U.S. court system. In, as a matter of fact, you know, U.S. court decisions can be challenged. They're heard by a tribunal of three uh, trade attorneys. It's a rotating panel of trade attorneys. Um, uh, usually they're corporate trade attorneys, you know, working for Fortune 500 companies <laughs> is their day job, but mm -hmm. serving on the on these tribunals, you know, as a side project, um, and the vast, vast majority of the time, they side with the corporations. They're they're typically housed at the World Bank's um, International Center for the Settlement of Investment Disputes. Um, you know, you and I don't have access to them. Nonprofits don't have access to them. Uh, it's just transnational <laughs> corporations, tr cross-border investors who can access these mm -hmm. tribunals. So they're completely undemocratic. They're essentially a, a parallel or secondary uh, court system, system of justice just for corporations. Mm -hmm. And the big, the big thing to know about them is that they uh, allow corporations to sue for lost expectation of profits, for so-called regulatory takings, where a government passed an environmental law, that's costing me money because you passed this environmental law, you have to compensate me for that. That's a type of case that would be laughed out of the U.S. court system. Mm -hmm. um, you know, indirect expropriation, no. <laughs> expropriation is us taking your property. Under the Constitution, we have to compensate you for that. But us passing a law, you know, that says you can't pollute anymore, that's not, that's not expropriation. You just can't pollute anymore. But under these tribunals, um, the, the vast, vast majority of cases, the tribunal sides of the corporation and forces the government to pay money. Most of um, the countries that we have this investor-to-state dispute system with, where corporations 
can access these tribunals is so far with developing countries. Um, so that uh, it's mainly U.S. corporations challenging the laws of smaller countries. Um, but now the Obama administration is talking about spreading that system throughout the entire Pacific Rim. Um, and the chickens could come home to roost with, okay. you know, Japanese, uh, other major countries that have, um, you know, corporations that are invested all over the world mm -hmm. uh, being able to challenge our laws and regulations okay. under the system. Right, yeah. So we want to get to this new agreement that mm -hmm. Obama is negotiating now. But before we do that, let's talk for a few minutes about the three agreements that were signed in, what, in the past year, year sure. and a half, uh, yeah. that were negotiated by President Bush, yeah. uh, but have now come home to roost. <laughs> yeah, so right. these were the Korea, uh, Panama, and Colombia free trade agreements. They were all negotiated by, uh, you know, President Bush the last, <laughs> President Bush the second. Um, you know, while he was campaigning for office, his, his first run, um, you know, President Obama, then Senator Obama was critical of all three of them. Um, but when he came into office, uh, he made some very minor tweaks and, and rushed them through Congress under fast track. Um, the promise of, of these agreements, again, was that they were going to create ex new export markets for U.S. jobs, uh, for U.S. products, and create jobs as a result. Uh, the reality, and under, you know, they've been implemented now for about 10 months, is that actually our trade deficit is up, meaning that we're importing now more from these countries than we're exporting. And actually, our exports are down, <laughs> which is shocking. Mm -hmm. um, they're about down about 5% uh, under these free trade agreements. So uh, they, have not <laughs> they have not created jobs. They've actually cost jobs for the American public. Um, and yet, they're trying to expand this model of agreement throughout the Pacific Rim now. OK, all right. A and so the, the uh, agreement with South Korea Talk a little bit about um, uh, about what kind of products uh, could have a made in Korea in South Korea label put on them. Yeah. So the um, I mean, well, anything. <laughs> I mean, from cars to high tech products, solar panels, you name it. Um, you know, that are assembled in South Korea can now be imported into the United States under this agreement. Uh, the problem is that there are very, very weak rule of origin provisions put in place. What that means is that South Korean firms can import the, the lion's share of the product, you know, the parts, if you're talking about a computer or a cell phone or a car, from countries that, you know, China, Vietnam, potentially even North Korea, um, you know, import these parts. And then as long as they're assembled in South Korea, they can be imported into the United States duty-free. Um, with, with a made in South Korea label. With a made in South Korea label, yeah. yes, that's correct. Yeah, right. So it's, it's sort of a backdoor way for, you know, products to get into the United mm -hmm. States without paying any duties. Yeah, and, and, and then I, I heard that uh, at, the, at the border of North and South Korea, there was uh, essentially a system of um, the Kilo Dory uh, factories being set up owned by South Koreans in North Korea? That's right. I mean, just like in, in the United States and Mexico, a lot of U.S. firms have factories right across the border in Juarez and Tijuana. A lot of South Korean firms have uh, factories just across the border in North Korea, the Kaesong Industrial Complex being a, you know, a major center for that, where you know workers are paid literally pennies an hour um, uh, we've heard reports of that you know, being paid in, you know, in scrip, you know, <laughs> where yeah. they don't even get money, they get, you know, store credit to buy soap or socks or something uh -huh. like that. Um, you know, and these parts are assembled, uh, you know, are made in North Korea and then theoretically assembled in South Korea and, you know, shipped all over the world. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. It, it's so uh, two, of the f two of the groups in the United States that particularly supported that agreement were the auto workers and the automakers mm -hmm. and the, the beef exporters. Yeah. <laughs> Talk so, about that for a moment. Um, I, you know, I think that, I don't want to speak for anyone, but I think <laughs> the auto workers, you know, supported it for political reasons. Um, you know, but the promise was this was going to create new markets for U.S. cars. It's going to create new markets for U.S. beef. And, you know, so far, 10 months in, um, our beef exports are down. <laughs> Our deficit in both beef and, uh, well, certainly our, our beef exports are down and our deficit in autos is way, way up. Mm -hmm. um, so it hasn't worked out, you know, as they'd hoped. Right. So I, I think the, the imports of South Korean autos is up 
while yeah. the export of American-made audios going to South Korea is down. So just the opposite effect of, of what was what was being sold. Yeah, no, and I mean, it, and it makes sense. What? People in one country are paid far less than people in another country. Um, oftentimes the environmental regulations in one country are far weaker than another country. Um, and so production is going to shift around the globe under these packs to wherever labor is the most exploited and to wherever, you know, environmental regulations and other regulations are the weakest. Mm -hmm. That's been the legacy of these trade agreements since NAFTA. Um, and that's what we're trying to reverse. Great, great. Yeah. So let's let's go ahead and talk about this Trans-Pacific Partnership mm -hmm. that o President Obama is negotiating. So, just yeah, s spill it. So, <laughs> uh, I, the Trans-Pacific Partnership is the largest corporate power grab so far this millennium. Uh, it's a new trade and investment pact between the United States and ten countries throughout the Pacific Rim. Um, just among those ten, this would be the largest free trade agreement in U.S. history. Uh, but it also has what's called a docking mechanism, meaning that other countries can dock on or join over time. And the express intent of it is to eventually cover the entire Pacific Rim. Uh, the difference between this one and, and some past attempts to do similar things is that now they've cherry-picked you know, the 10 nations that are most willing to play ball with the corporate agenda. Um, and then the idea is they'll set the standards among those 10 and then pressure other countries one at a time to join. Um, so it's a new strategy on their part, and I, I think, you know, from their vantage point, a very smart one. Um, this, you know, is, uh, is a por corporate power grab, and there's a lot of corporations that have a dog in this fight. So, you know, the manufacturers, the retailers, the Walmarts, they want to be able to ship jobs to countries that are even lower paying than China, countries like Vietnam and Malaysia, where workers are horribly exploited. Uh, the drug companies want to use the TPP to extend the length of their drug patents, and, and prevent people from being able to access uh, affordable generic medications. The uh, extractive industries want to use the TPP to be able to export, you know, coal and oil and natural gas around the globe um, and, and basically be able to head off any sort of environmental laws, climate change regulations, things of that nature. Um, the food and sort of, you know, the life sciences companies want to use the TPP to weaken environmental regulations and consumer right to know provisions. So this is a big pact. I mean, it's got 29 separate chapters. Um, uh, interesting to know, after 15 major rounds and about three years of negotiations, U.S. negotiators still refuse to tell the American public what they've been proposing in our names. Meanwhile, they've granted about 600 corporate lobbyists access to the tax as, as special cleared advisors. So Walmart, Cargill, Chevron, they get to know, while you and I don't know what's being mm -hmm. negotiated. But some texts have leaked. You know, we've had conversations with negotiators from other countries. Um, we certainly know what, you know what the corporations are pushing for in their public testimony. And so, <laughs> you know, while we don't know the exact deals, we, we know that this is more of the same, just on a much more grandiose scale than ever before. Okay, all right. And so what countries are involved? So right now it's the, the U.S., Vietnam, Malaysia, Singapore, Brunei, uh, Chile, Peru, New Zealand, Australia, Canada, and Mexico. Canada and Mexico. And, you know, again, but it has a docking provision. So, you know, political leaders in Japan have said they want to join, and the Philippines have said they want to join. A number of countries have already expressed interest in joining, and uh, the U.S. Trade Representative has said, you know, he'd like nothing better for, than for China to join, that he could eventually see this covering half the countries of the world. All right. So uh, Obama has, has uh, said that this is the the, the trade uh, agreement for the 21st century. So this is what he's really talking about: yeah. is that it could be the the new global standard. Yeah. No. They absolutely want to set the terms of trade and investment policy. Um, you know, for the next generation or longer, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, basically work with those countries that are most willing to accept what the corporations are pushing for set the standard and then pressure other countries around the globe to, mm -hmm. to get with the program. Okay. All right. And so uh, some text has been leaked. Yeah. And so we have been able to take a look at that. Mm -hmm. And what has that told us? Yeah, so um, our organization, Citizens Trade Campaign, first published the leaked text of the intellectual property chapter. Um, that showed us two, two major things. One, um, that the U.S. is pushing for provisions that would both literally and effectively extend the length of drug patents. So if you think of, you know, a, a disease like HIV AIDS, um, you know, a brand name medication, a patented medication where 
governments are giving a monopoly, you know, patent rights to, to a corporation, um, you know, the price of those drugs could easily be over $10,000 per patient per year. Um, when it becomes generic, you know, that can go down to a, around $100 per patient per year. So they're trying to extend the length of these drug patents, mm -hmm. which means higher drug prices in the U.S. and other developed countries, higher health care costs. And in developing countries, it just means people can't access medicine for an additional number of years. Um, so that's one provision of the intellectual property chapter. Another has to do with copyright, and a lot of uh, internet freedom groups are upset. They feel that this is going to introduce what's called secondary liability, um, whereas, you know, if, if somebody posts something, say, on YouTube, and, you know, there's, you know, I posted my kid dancing, <laughs> a little video on YouTube, and there's a Justin Bieber song playing in the background, uh, who's responsible for that copyright violation, you know? The, under secondary liability, it would be YouTube, and YouTube would have to pay the penalty. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something that they're really upset about. There's also provisions that are uh, more technical <laughs> than my pay grade, but that have to do with um, how copies are made for search engines and different forms of streaming, you know, temporary copies um, that, you know, the internet is based on now um, and that would preference some s sorts of technologies over others. Um, so that's the intellectual property chapter. Really bad for public health, mm -hmm. um, and you know, really questionable on, on copyright. Um, and you know, different groups have different opinions on that. The other chapter that leaked was the investment chapter, and, and clearly showed the United States pushing to spread this um, investor to state dispute resolution throughout throughout the Pacific Rim. Right. So this is this is what in NAFTA was called Chapter Eleven. Yes, that exactly. everybody was really so upset about Chapter mm -hmm. Eleven. Um. And NAFTA is really the, you know, I mean, uh, up until recently, the only uh, example for the U.S. of us having an agreement like that with another developed country, Canada, under NAFTA. Um, this would, you know, theoretically spread that system, again, mm -hmm. throughout throughout the entire Pacific Rim. You know, the U.S. Trade Representatives to believe half the countries of the world. Um, so, you know, any U.S. law, regulation, permitting decision court decision um, that stands in the way of a corporate's expectation of corporation's expectation of profits uh, could be attacked under these tribunals. Right. And, 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 and those cases would go to the trade tribunals where they would never go back to the court systems of the countries that were actually That's involved. That's right. I mean, the court decisions of the countries could be challenged in these tribunals. Mm -hmm. So they take precedent over, you know, even our court mm -hmm. system. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. It's a, you know, w one of the things that the Alliance for Democracy has been involved with for a long time has been this question about corporate personhood mm -hmm. uh, and the uh, Supreme Court giving corporations in the United States uh, human rights, mm -hmm. constitutional rights. What these trade agreements, particularly when they include Chapter 11 investor, to prote investor, t um, investor protection clauses, essentially takes that to a global level. No, that's right. I mean, these are rights that human beings don't have. Mm -hmm. They're, you know, they're far beyond corporate personhood. Mm -hmm. They're, you know, corporate supermanhood. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, in terms of the in terms of the rights that, you know, even US citizens don't have, that domestic businesses do not have, mm -hmm. only transnational investors have yeah. those rights. Okay. Yeah. So, take a few minutes to talk about how we respond. Well, the, the big thing that we need to do is, number one, drag these trade agreements into the light of day, shine a light on them. Um, most people have no idea that this is going on. Um, the negotiators are rushing to finish this pact by October 2013, so we have until that time to really spread the word and wake people up that this is, you know, this is a bad, bad idea. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the way that we can, uh, you know, exercise the most power in the United States is by letting our elected officials know that we're watching and that we want them to weigh in on this process and that we absolutely do not want them to extend fast-track trade authority for the TPP or, or any trade agreement. Um, fast-track expired in 2007. Uh, it would need to be reauthorized by Congress so that the TPP could be considered under that, that policy-making procedure that would rush it through, uh, rush it through the Congress. Mm -hmm. And so we need people to be calling, you know, Congressman Blumenauer, Congresswoman Bonamici, Senator Wyden, um, and letting them know, you know, we're watching the TPP, we've got serious concerns about it, and we do not want you to approve fast track for this trade pact. Right. And so th those Congress people, of course, Oregon Congress people, but yeah. for those of 
and Washington but, or, State, or, all Washington the same. State, yes, and absolutely. wherever people are watching, they need to call their Congress people mm -hmm. and let them know that we're paying attention, That's and right. that we oppose fast track authority for the president. Uh, on, on this agreement, well, for, for all agreements. That's right. right, and you can visit our website, citizenstrade.org, to learn more information. You know, sign up for email alerts. We don't, <laughs> we yeah. don't send too many, just when it's really important. Um, and you know, here in Oregon, Oregon Fair Trade Campaign is a fantastic mm -hmm. organization. There's Washington Fair Trade Coalition in Washington State, where if people want to get more involved in fighting these deals, um, they can. Great, good. Thank you very much Thank for being here. Thank you for having me, I appreciate right. it. Good, good, thank you. Our guest today has been Arthur Stimolis, Executive Director of the Citizens Trade Campaign. More information on free trade and the Trans-Pacific Partnership is available at the Citizens Trade Campaign website at citizenstrade.org. And more on the campaign to defeat the Trans-Pacific Partnership is also available at the uh, tppxborder.org website. In 2008, Tim DeChristopher committed an act of civil disobedience civil disobedience when he bid millions of dollars he didn't have in a BLM land auction in order to prevent oil and gas exploitation in the rock, in the Red Rock Pacific lands of Utah. As Beth Gage, the director of the new documentary Bitter 70 says, Tim DeChristopher is a young man with a message that needs to be heard. Climate change is upon us and there's nothing, there is nothing more important to work for than a livable future. Join the Alliance for Democracy for a screening of this new documentary, Bitter 70, that follows Tim from being a college student to being an incarcerated felon. Here in Portland, that screening will be on Friday, March 8th, starting at 7 p.m. at the First Unitarian Church, Southwest 12th and Salmon in downtown Portland. But if you're not in Portland, check to see if it might be scheduled in your town or schedule a screening yourself. Visit their website at www.bitter70film.com. The mission of the Alliance for Democracy is to end corporate domination, establish true democracy, and create a just society based on a sustainable, equitable economy. Learn more about the National Alliance for Democracy at thealliancefordemocracy.org or a Portland website at, at afd-pdx.org. I want to thank our crew today for getting us on the air again. So thank you to Roger Bates, Joan Horton, Dave King, Brad Leach, and Tom Thomas. And thanks to the staff here at Portland Community Media for the use of their facilities, their studios, and also their advice on how, how we're able to get on the air. Thanks to the audience for, for joining us, and I hope we'll see you again next week. Bye.